Okay, so just to just to review for those of you joining in on the recording, um, we're we're talking about classic results for hypersurfaces, and then uh, we're going to compare higher co-dimension results to these classic results in in, a, in subsequent parts of the talk. Okay, so the key estimates. Um, well, one of them here uh, is about preservation of flows, but the rest are about particular uh, initial data. And so the roundness estimate will be for convex flows. The convexity estimate, this will be for mean convex flows. And then these latter results here, these are concerning two convex flows. Um, and we're going to discuss a few pinched flows in higher co-dimension and compare them to these flows. Um, OK, and then I just have to due diligence here, remark that uh, Huskin and Sinistrari's work, this paper in 2009, really only applies when n is greater than or equal to 3. So understanding 2 convexity in when the n is equal to 2 is a bit more difficult. And that work is due independently to Hasselhofer and Kleiner and Brendel and Huskin. OK, so let's review these first, these key estimates. Um, it's only worthwhile in the mean curvature flow and, and, and other geometric flows like the Ricci flow to study, uh, to impose assumptions on initial data if those assumptions are preserved subsequently along the flow. And so uh, it's important to know that both mean convexity and K convexity are independently preserved along the flow. So if we start with this assumption, we'll maintain this assumption. And in particular, they'll pass on to the, well, if they're scale invariant like this one, they'll pass on to the, uh, to the singularity model. Now, the roundness estimate is an estimate for convex flows. A convex flow means that we start with some convex body, and maybe there's some flatter parts, and maybe there's some rounder parts. And what we would expect the flow to do is it would take these rounder parts and move them in a little bit more quickly than it moves these flatter parts. And OK, that gives you the intuition that this sort of estimate is preserved under the mean curvature flow. Certainly, that's the case. But moreover, what's happening in these um, convex flows is like, the smallest eigenvalues, which correspond to the flattest parts, are pinching with the roundest parts of the manifold. They're coming together. And so for the singularity model, well, maybe I'll say that at the end, um, but it basically says that the eigenvalues of the second fundamental form have to be approaching one another. I'll, I'll show you that in a moment. OK, and then in the context of mean convex flows, uh, as I said, they the mean convex flows can't have the worst types of singularity models. And in particular, it's due to this convex, it's uh, because of this convexity estimate, which says that if we start with a flow that's mean convex, then the singularity models uh, have to have lambda one being non-negative. So uh, this part is uh, scale invariant, this part is not, but when you divide by H, you'll get that this is going to be approaching greater than or equal to zero as you approach the singularity model. And then up here, for example, on the singularity model, we get that the um, scale invariant quantity of the traceless part over the mean curvature in squared is approaching zero, which is all of the eigenvalues are approaching one another. Okay, uh, for the cylindrical estimate, this is um, a more general uh, estimate than the roundness estimate, and it applies in the context of two convex flows. And what it says is that in the, sing in the limit, singularity models have to satisfy uh, that the norm of the second fundamental form is bounded by a particular constant times the, nor or the square of the mean curvature. This allows for two possibilities. It allows for the possibility that lambda 1 over h is small. And it also allows for the possibility that lambda 1 over h is, say, greater than epsilon. And in this case, will recover the roundness estimate. So one singularity model you might expect under this condition is the sphere. Uh, and we'll see that in a second. The other possibility is encapsulated by this um, theorem I'll show you in a moment called the neck detection lemma. So that if this is small, then this pinching estimate here says the remaining eigenvalues, lambda 2 through lambda n, have to be very close. And so that means the cross section has to be spherical, and that'll correspond to a cylinder. That's where, that's its namesake. OK, and then the last estimate is the pointwise derivative estimate. And um, OK, this is important for all kinds of compactness results for singularity models. I'll tell you that uh, at the end of today's talk. But in addition, this kind of estimate, say, rules out uh, things like Grim Reaper solution uh, or Grim Reaper product with, a, with another solution so that it has the right dimension. Uh, because those kinds of things don't satisfy these pointwise derivative estimates. And so like in the limit here, the estimate is 
lambda, uh, the norm of the derivative of the second fundamental form is, well, pointwise bounded by the norm of the curvature. And uh, what we'll see is in higher co-dimension, these pointwise derivative estimates are maybe the analog of non-collapsing for the singularity models. Okay, so these are five estimates I want to talk about in higher co-dimension in a moment. There are, um, oh, I'll come back to that point. There are two results I want to tell you about. The first one is the neck detection lemma. And the second one, maybe I'll put both on here, is the neck continuation theorem. So the neck detection lemma, this is in that uh, paper for two convex flows by Huskin and Sinestrari, says that, well, it kind of says whatever I, I said, what I said before, which is when lambda one is small relative to the mean curvature, then you have this pinching, h squared minus one over n minus one, h squared is small. And what that'll say is that the remaining eigenvalues have to be close. And so the cross section of this guy would have to be sort of round. And that's why it corresponds to a cylinder um, in, in this hypersurface setting. The net continuation theorem says that, it, okay, if suppose that you are on a cylindrical region of your flow, how could you end? How, what would happen if you went to sort of the end of your neck? And it can happen in two ways. The first is you can open back up into a region of lower curvature. And the second possibility is that you can close off into a convex cap. And this is really, these two results are in a sense, the analogs of Perlman's, uh, Perlman's canonical neighborhood theorem. So I'll, maybe I'll scroll, I think I say that uh, just here. So these results, the way you should think of them are analogs of Perlman's canonical neighborhood theorem. They tell us about these regions of high curvature in these flows. Okay, and then the singularity formation is well understood. Well, we've known since uh, Huskin's seminal paper that in the convex case, the only singularity models are spheres. Uh, and thanks to a breakthrough and recent results, we actually now understand the two convex case, although we've understood it heuristically for a while, but new techniques allow us to show that the only singularity models under these two convex flows are these spheres, cylinders, ovals, and bowls um, that, that can possibly occur. Okay, so this is everything I wanted to say in co-dimension one. I'm ready to tell you about higher co-dimension, but before that, are there any questions? Yeah, I, I would like to know, um, th there are these models where you have a, you know, kind of dumbbells and they pinch off. Uh, and, and I guess people study what happens at that. Is that being included in, in what you've been yeah. telling us so far? Yes, if you have one of these neck yeah, pinches here, yeah. So yeah, let's say a three-dimensional version of that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. That'll that, that that's allowed in this um, two convex case because this pinching here, what's happening is uh, that'll correspond to a cylindrical singularity. And there's a degenerate okay. neck pinch as well, and that one will look, you know, the model is something like this, where this sort of pinches, like maybe one of the dumbbells is a lot smaller than the other, and so if uh -huh. you you know, if, if you uh, make it too small, then this will just move over and you'll get a, a spherical sing singularity. But if right. it's much bigger, you'll get a neck. And so then you do a continuous family uh, of possible initial data. And one of them corresponds to what's called a degenerate neck pinch. And, and that's modeled by the translating bowl soliton. And you can, you can continue through the pinch? There are a couple ways to do this. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so there's, of course, there's weak notions of mean curvature flow that allow you to yeah. flow right through these singularities. Um, right. But uh, today I'm going to be, the only thing I'll talk about today as far as weak flow is the actual formation be, of the pinch itself. It will be the formation yeah. of the singularities. And then okay. I'll tell you about some surgery procedure, which is, okay, it's not a solution of the flow or a weak solution in that sense, but it, you know, it, it allows for topological changes. So it's a version of a weak flow, I guess. Yeah. Okay, thank you. You bet. Thank you for the question. Okay, so let's go to higher co-dimension. Um, in higher co-dimension, the biggest change, of course, is that we go from a, a, like a, a, a parabolic PDE for a scalar to a parabolic system of PDEs, uh, or a, yeah, a system of PDE. And so in particular, things like the second fundamental form are now vector valued. Uh, so I'll denote by capital A the full vector valued second fundamental form, and then by a sort of abusive notation, let me relabel H so that it's also vector valued. I'll put absolute value uh, norm of H to talk about the scalar mean curvature. And then uh, in particular, whenever the scalar mean curvature is non-vanishing, I'll highlight a sort of principal direction in the normal bundle, which I'll denote my new one. 
And I'll also denote the principal component of the second fundamental form by this lowercase h. So this is the only term that's non-vanishing if for whatever reason our submanifold happens to lie in an n plus one dimensional subspace. But for now we let it lie in an arbitrarily large ambient uh, uh, Euclidean space. Uh, okay, and the two curvature assumptions I wanna tell you about in, in uh, relative to the co-dimension one case are the, well, the analog of mean convexity in higher co-dimension, which is just that this mean curvature vector should be non-vanishing. And then the condition we're very interested in today is what I'll call C-pinching, but which is sometimes also called quadratic C-pinching. And what it says is that the norm of the second fundamental form should be controlled by the norm of the mean curvature. Now, it's always the case, right, that uh, the norm of the mean curvature is controlled by the norm of the second fundamental form. So this is sort of a pinching result, except, or a pinching assumption rather, except that uh, A doesn't have eigenvalues as it does for the, uh, the co-dimension one case. Um, but let me just mention, so when, when you are in co-dimension one, of course this first condition is equivalent to mean convexity and for suitable constants, for suitable constants in this C pinching uh, condition, it actually implies K convexity. So we can't talk about the eigenvalues of this vector valued second fundamental form. We can talk about them for the principal component, but there aren't eigenvalues for this tensor in general, but we can talk about this pinching and in co-dimension one, it at least implies K convexity. Okay, uh, here are the flows that we're gonna talk about then. So I'll define two constants, C1 and C2. There's a technical constant here, four over three N, I'll come to that, but the important, part I want you to keep in mind is C1 is like one over N minus one and C2 is like one over N minus two uh, in, in dimensions that, uh, in most dimensions. And the key point here, uh, and this is maybe one of the more important results that I'll show you on this page, is that this C pinching condition is preserved. So as I said before, it's only worth studying conditions that are preserved if we impose them on initial data. And so this is due to Andrews and Baker uh, about 10 or 11 years ago now. And what they showed is that if you assume the constant C in your C pinching assumption is uh, less than four over three N, it's a technical constant, then this will be uh, true all the way to the first singular time. Um, now it has to be a strict inequality, but it turns out the strict inequality is preserved. Uh, and well, the four over three N is not geometric. It comes from an application of the maximum principle. So what they basically do to prove this is they look at the evolution equation of this difference here. And this is more complicated in higher co-dimension than it is in co-dimension one. But if you're pinched, if the algebra simplifies a little bit. You can sort of dominate uh, bad terms that appear in the evolution equation of the second fundamental form by a good term that appears here and show that this is preserved. But this isn't geometric. The geometric assumptions are one over n minus one and one over n minus two, which are the analog of, this one is the analog of convex, and this one will be the analog of uh, two convex. And let's see that. So the is, here's what's been- uh, is, yeah, that, is that known to be sharp or, you know, is there anything which is expected, which would be more meaningful than this like four over so, three n? No, four over three N is not sharp for sure. The other constants are sharp. And the idea is, so this in co-dimension one, uh, this assumption say here, this, uh, yeah. if lambda one is zero, then all the other eigenvalues yeah. have to be the have same, but yeah. Yeah, so it's sharp in higher, yeah, exactly. It's sharp in higher dimensions, but this four over three N is very unsatisfying. Um, and I wanna give you later a little bit more of geometric intuition of what's happening. Uh, and maybe this is approachable. Uh, maybe that we can approach this by another route, which will kind of reveal what's going on, but, but I'll come to it. Okay. Okay. So here's, here's what's been done. So uh, a lot of the results I just mentioned in co-dimension one have been generalized in particular in their original paper where they introduced this C pinching condition, Andrews and Baker managed to uh, recover the roundness estimate in the, you know, whenever you're strictly less than one over N minus one. So Basically what it kind of says is if you're underneath this threshold of one over N minus one, the only singularity, uh, well, the, you get this roundness estimate and what we'll see is the only singularity model is the sphere. 
And then some years later, uh, Nguyen managed to prove many of the results due to uh, Huskin and Sinistrari for these C2 pinch flows, where the natural assumption is 1 over n minus 2. In particular, he can prove the cylindrical estimate, the pointwise derivative estimates, and then the first part of the canonical neighborhood theorems, which is the net detection lemma. Uh, OK, what's interesting is, well, of course, we're missing a convexity estimate. At first, this shouldn't make sense because as I said, there's not really a good notion of convexity in higher co-dimension. And then what we're really after is a net continuation theorem. So what, what uh, Nguyen can show is singularities are modeled on cylinders, but he can't control all of the high curvature regions yet. Um, we'll see later that, that he can. And so I just, I, I sort of passed this remark earlier, but I just wanted to mention that uh, the approach in Huskin and Sinistrari is to use the convexity estimate, which is three, uh, plus the assumption of two convexity to imply the uh, cylindrical estimate, which they then use to get the derivative estimates. And so Nguyen's approach is sort of the complement of that. He, he has a pinching assumption, which is what four essentially is. This cylindrical estimate is a pinching assumption. Um, and so then he uses it to prove derivative estimates. And once you have derivative estimates, you can do blow up arguments in the spirit of Perlman or uh, originally due to Brian White. So just a, some contrast in higher co-dimension. Okay, and then here's where uh, I become interested in the theory. So uh, Andrews and Baker managed to show that, that, that those C1 pinch flows, the singularity models are co-dimension one spheres. M maybe that's a little clearer because it's an umbilicity uh, a condition. They show, right, that the norm of the full second fundamental form over h squared so that, or well, maybe the traceless component of the full one is going to zero. So um, I don't think maybe this one wasn't as surprising, but what was surprising is that in Nguyen's work when he proved his neck detection lemma, the, uh, which is the, it's sort of the analog. This is, this condition here is saying that lambda one should be small. There's no lambda one floating around here, but this is like lambda one is small and the rest of the eigenvalues are close. And it shows that it's actually, he shows it's actually close to a co-dimension one drinking round cylinder. Uh, so the natural question here is, you know, are all the singularity models for these flows co-dimension one? And, uh, you know, when, when my advisor, Simon Brendel asked me this question, at the time he uh, had a proof of the classification of singularity models in the two convex case. And so this question here, you can imagine like a like in higher co-dimension, let me draw it from top down. So this is a top down view. This is a cylinder. Um, and this is say an n plus one dimension hyperplane. And the question is, is it possible for the cap? We know that this is modeled on that potentially on that bowl soliton, or it could open back up. That's kind of what the neck continuation theorem said. So is it possible the cap could somehow leave that n plus one dimensional hyperplane that you know your flow is close to? That's what we're kind of asking uh, when we ask this question. So there's some reason to believe that it's not the case. Uh, for the curve shortening flow, uh, an old result due to Stephen Altshuler shows that uh, the singularity models must all be planar. And in fact, this holds in any co-dimension. It was later extended to to a higher co-dimension. Um, okay, but we shouldn't expect this behavior for the mean curvature flow uh, in higher dimensions in general. That may be too optimistic because uh, you know we could use the Nash embedding theorem and then we could evolve all manifolds and understand them through sort of uh, co-dimension one singularities. That, that's probably too promising, but as we'll see, the C pinching seems to be a, a promising starting point and, and maybe not the end of the story. Okay. Uh, let's see if any questions before we go on to the planarity estimate, which is the new estimate in this area. Okay, so uh, let's let's first go back. Sorry, oh. so there is no known counter example to this statement. Uh, that they're always like, co-dimension one. Yeah, in principle, it could always. Well, it's, I'll come back to this point because. Um, We'll see that for C pinch flows, there's, there can't be a counter example, but these C pinch flows, they're going, we'll see they're almost planar. Uh, there are ancient solutions uh, which cannot be embedded into smaller co-dimension spaces, but I'm not sure about singularity models. Um, and certainly they would have to have a, a, 
they wouldn't be pinched like this. So I'll come back to that. Okay, but first let me interpret for you what this pinching estimate is sort of saying. So how should we interpret C pinching in higher co-dimension? Well, I've defined for you the principal component of the second fundamental form, and it's natural then to uh, define the non-principal component or the sort of complement of the principal component. And this is what I'm gonna label A hat for the rest of today's talk. And so A hat is the difference between the full second fundamental form and the principal component which is a multiple of the principal normal vector. Uh, so in higher co-dimension, of course, a hat should vanish. Uh, sorry, in co-dimension one, a hat should vanish. Uh, and moreover, we can expand the norm of the full fundamental form in terms of its trace component, which is the mean curvature, the traceless part of the principal component, and this complementary component, which I'm calling a hat. And if we rewrite this assumption here, then what we see is it's really an estimate for the traceless part of the principal component, as well as an estimate for uh, this non, uh, a scale invariant estimate for this uh, complementary component. So we've seen, we've seen this estimate a few times now. This is uh, like a roundness estimate or cylindricality. Um, for example, in the case where we take this constant C to be one over n minus one or one over n minus two, it sort of pinches down to the next one and we, we sort of improve. But we you know, haven't seen this estimate before. And so we should interpret what, it, what it's really saying. And to do that, what we wanna set it to zero. So here's the, main, uh, here's the first proposition in the main result concerning A hat. Let's suppose I have an immersion of a connected but possibly incomplete manifold Let's assume it's mean convex. So this H is non-vanishing. And in that case, we can define the principal component of the second fundamental form. Uh, I want this quantity to be positive definite. That's just to avoid curves. So the, the, the degenerate case here is where H only has one eigenvalue and it's equal to the mean curvature. And I don't want that case because uh, then I'm on a curve and A hat is automatically zero on curves. So this result won't work in that context. But if A hat is zero and this is positive definite, we're not on a curve, then it's vanishing is equivalent to the immersed hypersurface, to the immersed submanifold actually being an immersed hypersurface so that there's some n plus one dimensional subspace that it lies in. The proof is very straightforward, but you have to take for granted one part and it's this first part, which is that the Kodatsi identity implies, the Kodatsi identity rather, plus this positivity assumption implies that the principal normal vector is parallel within the normal bundle. I'm gonna come back and show you where this comes from. It's a projection of the Kodatsi identity onto the complement of the principal component of the normal bundle. But um, it'll be better if we see it later. But in any case, you, can, uh, you could possibly believe it if A hat vanishes, and you have the, an identity like this, then okay. Um, that says that H, you know, G I K minus H I K uh, times sort of the kth derivative, kth derivative of the principal normal is zero. And then you can invert this matrix. Well, once you know that the uh, principal normal vector is parallel, we can complete it to a basis of parallel vectors in the normal bundle. So that's what I'll call new two. Uh, through new capital N minus little n. So this is now just a basis for the normal bundle. And moreover, I just pick any, any path between any two points in M and I want these to be uh, just parallel along that path. Okay, the next step is just to compute the tangential uh, derivative of these uh, other normal vectors. And it, you know, it, because when you take a tangential derivative, say we're taking it in the derivative and the direction of gamma, of the, uh, of the normal vector nu alpha. And then say we're interested in the tangential direction EI where EI is some basis of tangent vectors. Well then you can sort of, these are orthogonal to one another. So we can move the derivative over with a minus sign. And then we get gamma prime EI. And this here is a, is a curvature term, but by assumption A hat is zero. So this curvature term has no, it, it's, not, it's zero in the direction of nu alpha. So this vanishes as well. And in particular, the tangential derivative of these normal vectors vanish. So now if the normal ones, the normal derivatives vanish and the tangential derivatives vanish, then the ambient derivatives also vanish. And these uh, a priori, these vector fields are, which are just parallel in the normal bundle are actually parallel in the ambient space. And so in particular, what this shows is that the 
coordinates corresponding to these normal directions are constant on our, on our submanifold. And so it has to lie in an n plus one dimensional affine subspace. Okay, well, this is a promising start because uh, we have now the sort of result we're after, co-dimension one when a hat vanishes, and we have a good uh, tensor to study, which is this a hat under the flow. Uh, and so it turns out that this tensor does have a good evolution equation, although it can get a bit technical, we'll see. Uh, but here's the main result. This is called the planarity estimate. Now I'll come back to this technical constant in a moment. The important part here is that what we get from this estimate, if we, okay, we assume n is greater than or equal to five, but that's only because Andrews and Andrews and Baker's result is the best you can say when n is two, three, or four. And we assume it's a C pinch flow for some constant C, coming back to that. Um, and then what we get is a, a sort of pinching, well, a vanishing result, I guess, um, as we approach the first uh, singular time for the quantity A hat. So this actually has to become zero when the curvature uh, h goes to infinity when the mean curvature blows up. And of course, the mean curvature blows up at the first singular time be because the second fundamental form has to blow up and we're in this c pinched setting. Now, now what is this uh, constant? Um, sort of unsatisfactorily, this is not optimal. There's this 4 over 3n floating here. That's the one we saw from Andrews and Baker's proof. This is so that we can talk about the preservation of this condition along the flow. And then there's this other technical constant, which is behaves like three over two, three over two n. Um, and that's one that arises in my proof of the result. And so ideally you would like it to hold for four over three n, but certain estimates don't, don't work. Um, and these, these are very close, uh, but anyway, it, it, these aren't optimal for sure. Uh, but they, they do apply in the context of C1 pinched flows and C2 pinched flows as we'll see when, when n is sufficiently large. Okay, so this is the estimate. It resembles uh, Huskin's estimate for the traceless principal component of the second fundamental form. Um, and now I'd like to talk to you about the proof. But uh, before I do, let me just see if there are any, any questions. Okay. All right, so let's do an overview of the proof. Uh, I think it's fairly straightforward. There's, uh, like in most proofs, um, an insight. And then in this case, there's a long computation. Uh, so the insight, the most important insight is to analyze the fundamental identities under this decomposition into sort of the principal component of the normal bundle and its complement. Uh, we can do this because of the mean convexity assumption. So this is like, because we know that H is positive, we, we can define this new one principal normal direction. And then we can analyze fundamental identities like the Gauss equation, the Ricci equation and the Cadazzi equation under this decomposition. Uh, that's a very useful idea. In fact, I think originally Andrews and Baker had this idea. They did it for the Ricci equation and for the Gauss equation. And then uh, I guess my contribution is to do it for the Cadazzi equation. And the Cadazzi equation plays the important part in this proof, at, at least in a few parts. We saw it earlier in the proposition. Once you, you know, have a handling on these fundamental identities and what they imply, then our, our proof is fairly straightforward. Okay, we have to compute the evolution equation for this non-principal component in norm. There were a few things to try here. Uh, you know, if this didn't work, there are other tensors which vanish in co-dimension one, and maybe this isn't the right quantity, but it, it turns out to work. And then we wanna compare it to this quantity F here, which is this uh, difference between norm H squared and A squared. It's well known in, in this area that this has a good evolution equation. Um, it was done by Huskin and Sinistrari when they had the cylindrical pinching and, and we'll use it too. Uh, so this thing is a very useful uh, quantity to compare to uh, when you're trying to prove a, a monotonicity formula like via the maximum principle. So the goal here is to compare the evolution equation of A hat, sort of how much this could be growing to uh, sort of how much F is growing uh, and show that, that we get a monotonicity. Now, it, that'll amount to estimating reaction terms that come out of this and gradient terms which come out of this. So the evolution equation is a little bit, well, it's a lot more complicated than in the co-dimension one case. So I'll show you that. Uh, once we have that, we'll actually be able to show that the way you should interpret this estimate here uh, is that you, know, you sort of ignore the spatial derivatives. What it says is that this quantity is not only preserved, but it turns out that this 
quantity here is always positive. So this is actually strictly negative, maybe strictly less than zero, which is showing that a, the ratio a hat over f is actually strictly decreasing along the flow. And then it, at the very end, we can just use the maximum principle. Um, here's a now a not scale invariant qu quantity that we're looking at. And we don't need to use Stimpache iteration. So Stimpache iteration is ubiquitous in this area because typically in the mean curvature flow, the reaction terms, they are just, just enough to get you pr preservation, but not enough to prove monotonicity. And here we, we don't even need that. So this is maybe even a, a sign that there's more to, there's, there's maybe more you could do, uh, but anyway, we don't need Stimpache iteration, which makes the proof a little bit, sim well, a little bit simpler, yeah. Okay, and then let's talk about some of those key ideas. So the first one I mentioned was decomposing certain identities. I'll put them both on the screen for you. Um, under this decomposition of the normal bundle, so one of the ones that is uh, important uh, to Andrews and Baker is the Ricci equation. The Ricci equation tells you how to compute the normal curvature in terms of the second fundamental form. So in co-dimension one, this guy has no curvature, but in higher co-dimension it will. Uh, and, and that curvature is determined by, well, it turns out just determined by the non-principal component of the second fundamental form, as well as one curvature term which interacts, it's like an interaction term between the principal part of the bundle and the non-principal part of the bundle. And, and that sort of is a, a term which is, well, this term here is quadratic in A hat and quadratic in the traceless component. So the important takeaway from this first equation I want you to remember is that this term is uh, quartic in A hat, and then it has a quadratic term in, in uh, the traceless component and in A hat. Now, this, this one, as I said, de this decomposition in analyzing these terms is you know, the original ideas due to Andrews and Baker. One really important ingredient um, that I used was just to decompose the, the basic Kadatsi equation, but under this decomposition. So there's one here where, you know, if A hat is zero, this is just the usual derivative of the principal component. Okay, there's a derivative of A hat in the principal direction. That's that interaction term I mentioned too. But there's also a Kadatsi equation for this, this sort of projection of A hat, or sorry, the projection of the derivative of the second fundamental form to this E hat, to this complemented bundle. Um, okay, and, and this is where I mentioned earlier. So this, this quantity here is symmetric in I, J, and K. And so if I write down the other one, let's say it's H, I, K, uh, now with J per new one. And then uh, this hat here means the projection of the derivative onto to E hat. And then let's switch uh, I and J here. And then if you were to trace this quantity, let's say over I and K, you would recover what we used for uh, in our proof of the proposition that A hat vanishing is equivalent to lying in an N plus one dimensional subspace. So the Kadatsi equation tells you something about how A hat vanishing is related to the uh, derivative of the principal normal vanishing. Um, and it, it will tell you one more thing I'll tell you in a moment. Okay, uh, and then the key like ingredient for the technical part of the proof. If, if the other slide was about insight, then this is just about like a technical approach, which is that the pinching quantity that we are discussing has a good evolution equation. So in case you haven't seen them, the evolution equations of the second fundamental form and the um, mean curvature in higher co-dimension have these complicated algebraic structures. Of course, uh, this term here, uh, the normal uh, curvature that we just mentioned is sort of a um, well, it looks like a curvature term, but it's, it's got, you know, as many components as the second fundamental form has, um, and it's not present in co-dimension one. So this is zero uh, in co-dimension one. And then even here, there's sort of interaction between the different directions of the second fundamental form. So in co-dimension one, this is very simple. It's just two H to the fourth. And, and similarly down here, there's interaction between the different directions of um, A and H. But in, in my notation, this has the uh, simplification uh, of looking like, like this because of how I've defined lowercase h. So the equation looks the same, although it's a little more complicated in, um, in higher co-dimension uh, because of the interaction. Okay, and then what we do is we, we need to look at the evolution equation of f. This is what we're gonna compare to the evolution equation of a hat. Uh, and it turns out that, okay, all I've done is take the difference between these two equations to get this equation. Um, but it turns out, so this is going to be positive because of uh, um, an idea due to Huskin about the uh, 
I'll show you, I'll write down the uh, estimate for you. It's like a sharp version of this uh, integral estimate using the Kadatsi equation. So, you know, in general, you should be able to do an estimate that looks like this. It says the derivative of the second fundamental form can control the derivative of the mean curvature uh, with a factor of one over n, but you can do better. Uh, using the Kadatsi equation, you can actually improve this to three over n plus two. And uh, I'll use that later as well. And so this term is going to be non-negative. Now, why is this term non-negative? Well, as I mentioned, uh, this one, what, what we can do is, uh, so I guess this is quartic in A hat, and it has another term, and, and this one is uh, quartic in A. But the, the, the sort of biggest positive component here is a term which looks like mean curvature to the fourth. And as long as you're sufficiently pinched, uh, this term will control the sort of uh, quartic a hat terms and then the quadratic uh, lowercase h and quadratic a hat terms that appear here. So actually, let me show you what it, yeah, let me show you what it looks like uh, here. What we can do is if we if we multiply by a normalizing factor, we can pull out a lot of positive terms. So this is um, in particular this evolution equation here can be used to produce a positive term which looks like a hat to the fourth and a positive term, which looks like a hat squared and the principal component squared. And so this is looking very promising, at least for the algebraic terms. It turns out you can also pull out these gradient terms. And, and that's uh, what, I'll, uh, what I mentioned earlier about the gradient estimates being a, a bit harder. So when CN uh, is less than four over three N, this side is uh, everywhere non-negative. And that's a very useful uh, idea. Okay, and then let me just show you what the evolution of a hat looks like. Um, okay, it's complicated, right? Uh, but it simplifies a little bit when we try to understand what's happening. So there are these algebraic terms, reaction terms here, which look like, okay, as I said, this is a hat to the fourth, this is a hat to the fourth, and we can control those kinds of terms using the evolution equation of F. This one here, as I mentioned earlier, this one is like the traceless component in norm squared, and then a hat in norm squared, and we can control a term like that. So these reaction terms are looking like, okay, there's a chance we can control them. There's a good Bachner term here, but then there's sort of this bad gradient term. And this doesn't come up in co-dimension one and it's confusing to understand. The really good part about this is that it's small in the quadratic sense. So A hat is small. And then as we know by the Kadatsi identity, A hat being small should imply smallness for this derivative as well. So that's one of the promising ideas and that gives you hope to control this. The actual estimate ends up being like uh, using Young's inequality and sort of breaking up each of these three terms in a particular way. Um, how do we control it? As I said earlier, there's this, this maybe this important lemma in the paper that says that using the Kadatsi identity, um, we can, we can con as I said, I guess earlier that we can use a hat to control the norm of um, the principle, the, sorry, the derivative of uh, the principal unit normal. So what this is saying is that a hat small means this quantity is small. And, and that's saying that this is quadratically small. And that's sort of the promising step in looking at this evolution equation. Um, okay, and so, and then as I said, uh, maybe one or two slides ago, in fact, I have to use a, an improved version of, the, of this derivative estimate where we use the Kadatsi identity to get this factor out front, three over n plus two, which is a little bit better than one over n. And, that idea, I think it actually goes back to Hamilton um, in the Ricci flow. He decomposes the derivative of Ricci using the Bianchi identity. And, and this is very similar. Okay. Okay, great. Uh, okay, so that's all I wanted to tell you about the proof. It's in some sense simple. There's one uh, insightful step, which is breaking things down in terms of co-dimension one and higher co-dimension. There's something technical, I guess it's how do we uh, use what, what's the right comparison quantity for a hat. And it happens to be the pinching quantity F that I showed you earlier. Um, and then understanding this equation takes some work and maybe that's a bit technical, not so worthwhile in a, uh, a talk, but that's okay. And, uh, okay. I'd like to end today's talk by telling you a number of applications. So the first one is, and, uh, what I owe you is that the planarity estimate implies singularity models are actually co-dimension one. Um, what I owe you is the following. So when you start with a, a solution, which a flow, which satisfies this with a, with a strict um, inequality and you do a blow up to get a singularity, 
it's possible that this becomes like a weak inequality. And in particular, then perhaps h could be zero. And if you remember uh, in that proposition about a hat vanishing, we really needed h to be positive. So you should be like, uh, wait a second. Uh, but the good news is the we can we can sort of pass the inequality into the limit. So if uh, if we let f denote you know uh, a like slightly modified pinching quantity here, this is strict. So I can certainly find a little epsilon here, and then this will be preserved. And what it'll show is that f is comparable to the norm of the mean curvature. And moreover, this f has a, a good evolution equation. So we can use the strong maximum principle when we do the blow up to either conclude that f is everywhere positive or equivalently zero. Now, if f were equivalently zero, that would say the mean curvature is equivalently zero, which would say that the second fundamental form is equivalently zero. And OK, we're not on a singularity model. But in the event that f is positive, and it should be if you normalize, say, the mean curvature to be 1 at the points of the sort of along the blow up sequence, then f will be positive, And therefore, you'll be in the mean convex case. And our previous proposition will tell you now that the singularity models are co-dimension 1. OK, and then um, let's see. I sh shall I have about five minutes or so? Does that sound right? Or 10? OK, so, uh, okay, so then let me just go through quickly some of the applications of this estimate to our understanding of singularities. OK, so the first thing is um, I can, you know, once you know that the singularity models are co-dimension 1, you should ask, remember this constant C2, which was like 1 over n minus 2, at least in the optimal case? Um, we should ask, okay, are the singularity models really all the same as they are in co-dimension one? The, 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 the only hard part, and it's a little hard here, is that the classification result uh, due to Brendel Choi, Anjanat Daskalopoulos, and Session in co-dimension one, it used in a, a, a concept called non-collapsing, a, a quantitative embeddedness assumption, which doesn't make sense in higher co-dimension. It does make sense on the singularity models because the singularity models are co-dimension one, but there's some work to showing non-collapsing. But the anyway, at least in these C2 pinched flows, you can recover the classification of singularities. And once you have a classification of singularity models, well, going back to Perlman, uh, or it's even, it's even better than what Perlman had. He just had a qualitative description of singularity models. But I have a classification that can prove a canonical neighborhood theorem for the flow. This is the uh, analog of the net continuation theorem. But I, remember, I also said those two results we're missing from the higher co-dimension case. And, and actually, you can we can get those results with the planarity estimate. And, and these are due to, this is due to Nguyen. So uh, he proved a version of the net continuation theorem and then developed a surgery procedure for higher co-dimension mean curvature flow. And then uh, a very interesting paper due to Nguyen and Lynch. So as I said before, convexity a priori doesn't make sense in higher co-dimension. But if the singularity models are co-dimension one, and we're in the mean convex setting, then it, they should probably be convex. And in fact, that's what these authors can show. So we've recovered those two missing results from our list before. Um, yeah, OK. And then just, just really quickly, I'll tell you about this classification of singularities. As I said, the important uh, thing is to establish non-collapsing. So my singularity models a priori aren't non-collapsed, but they do satisfy a certain set of assumptions. Some of them are standard, non-flat, complete, connected, ancient. OK, them being co-dimension 1, that's the planarity estimate at work. The fact that they have to be weakly convex and uniformly too convex, well, that's the pinching results due to Nguyen. And, and, and the other result here, these derivative estimates also due to Nguyen, these are the replacement for non-collapsing. So we don't have embeddedness before we take the blow up in higher co-dimension. But we take the blow up. We know it's co-dimension 1. But we can't say it's non-collapsed. But we can say that it does satisfy these pointwise derivative estimates. And it turns out that, OK, satisfying these pointwise derivative estimates, that should rule out the Grim Reaper. It should be non-collapsed, is the idea. Um, and indeed, that's what I can show. So that if we have uh, you know, something, a singularity model satisfying these constraints, so certainly for C2 pinch flows, they satisfy these uh, properties, then it has to be uh, non-collapsed. And then consequently, in the case of C2 pinched flows, um, yeah, so then it has to be a, a shrinking sphere, a shrinking cylinder, a translating bowl, or an ancient oval. We've recovered the same classification. Um, 
this proof is an adaptation of work of Huskin and Sinistrari, uh, which is kind of, it's kind of a nice version of their work. Their work, they have to work with almost convexity, but I sort of do a blow up and work on the actual singularity models. Um, but it's very, it's very closely follows their work. Uh, and then, <clears throat> okay, I mentioned this one, we get the singularity classification. This is sort of a standard step. It hasn't really been done in the mean curvature flow. It's not, I guess, typical, but these pinched flows, they behave a lot like uh, intrinsic flows in some, some way. And so it turns out that you can prove sort of the, an intrinsic version of a canonical neighborhood theorem for these flows. And, and that's what the second result says. It says that when H is large, then in an, in an intrinsic neighborhood, large on the scale of the inverse of the curvature, so this radius, this curvature radius, the flow has to closely resemble one of the singularity models that could appear. And that's kind of standard. And the argument follows a, well, it, it's an adaptation of uh, Perlman's work. Okay. Um, yeah, and then there's the key. Oh, uh, I guess, so this is this is just basically the canonical neighborhood theorem in the non-compact case. You don't have to read this whole thing. Let me just draw you the picture. It says that in the non-compact case, so a singularity model for these C2 pinched flows, there's a cap region. This has controlled geometry. So for example, Controlled geometry means it's uniformly convex, and then the curvature at any one point controls the curvature at any other point. And then again, outside of it, there's a tube where every point has to lie at the center of a neck. So that's the structure theorem, uh, very much written exactly like a, like a Perlman structure theorem. And then here's a picture of sort of what non-collapsing looks like. It, and, and this is my last slide, I think. Um, so you know, on, on, the, on the cap area, you have uniform convexity. So it has to be bending upwards, but you also have um, sort of controlled curvature. It can't bend in too quickly. And so that means you can sort of squeeze in one ball and then convexity will imply that you sort of contain this other ball in here. And so that, that's what non-collapsing means. And, and on neck points, you can show something similar that you can squeeze in a ball. Singularity models are non-collapsed and we recover the classification of co-dimension one and, and then we get a canonical neighborhood theorem. So the, what I'm trying to convince you of is that the planarity estimate had some, some uses, at least in understanding singularities. Okay, and let me end with some questions for you. Some of the questions that are, that are on my mind and that interest me certainly is, the first is a general problem. So this uh, preserved pinching of Andrews and Baker, uh, it's, a great, it's a great class of flows. Um, and now we should understand them appropriately as sort of these almost planar flows. So they're sort of stuck within uh, close to an n plus one dimensional hyperplane and then Singularity models have to actually pinch to a hyperplane, uh, an n plus one dimensional uh, plane. But uh, can we find more examples of curvature conditions that are preserved in higher co-dimension, even ones that interpolate between co-dimension one preserved conditions and these higher co-dimension conditions? There, there are not very many that are well known. And the, the biggest difficulty here is the algebraic structure um, in the evolution equation of say the second fundamental form. Okay, and then the other question, and I guess this is to Camille's question earlier, which is, you know, why does this planarity fail? What's the object in the way of it holding? I don't, I mean, it's, I think it's too optimistic in it to expect it to hold in general. Um, there are results due to um, A.O. Soon and, and Douglas Stryker for these ancient solutions that don't lie in, uh, they don't lie in small uh, subspaces, um, but there aren't too many, ex I think those ancient solutions aren't singularity models because they're not, I don't think there's uh, shrinkers under the flow I think, so anyway, if you could produce a shrinker, which doesn't lie, then that would show there are these, that would be a sort of obstruction, but it would be nice to produce other obstructions. Um, and one thing to think about is, can you, is there like a critical angle that you could, where you, where you can desingularize, say shrinkers uh, that lie in one plane or another plane, and um, maybe that could produce examples. I don't know, but something to think about. Uh, and then, um, oh, uh, this is a question. So I, I proved non-collapsing for these C2 pinched flows. So when C is one over N minus two, singularity models are non-collapsed, but you don't get non-collapsing for free. Uh, but we used sort of my conjecture is that derivative estimates, pointwise derivative estimates are equivalent to non-collapsing. Um, certain, there's a result, let me mention, of, of Hasselhofer and Kleiner, which says that non-collapsing uh, implies these pointwise derivative estimates in co-dimension one. So maybe we could recover it um, more generally for these C pinch flows. And then lastly, you know, Kolding and Minicozzi actually have just quite a lot of interesting work in higher co-dimension. Um, in particular, one result related to this is if the blowdown of a singularity model, so asymptotically, it's a multiplicity one cylinder. 
uh, then uh, it has to be codimension one. Their result actually shows something like if it's one of these ge uh, generalized cylinders and the multiplicity is one, then it lies in a, the flow, the original flow, which is the singularity model in this context, um, has to lie in an n plus one dimensional subspace. I wonder if that can give a different proof of this result, um, or it, it, you know, if, if to what extent their result uh, and my result overlap for these nearly planar flows and uh, for these uh, flows which happen to be asymptotically cylindrical and multiplicity one in the sense of their, their, that they're interested in. Okay, and, and, and that's it for today. I uh, just want to thank you for your attention um, and let me know if you have any questions. Thanks. Thank you, thank you. Uh, so can, can you, can you, could you go back one, uh, one slide? Here? So, yes, so uh, that, um, okay, so that result is telling you if you're... Uh, this one? Yes, so the four one. So if you, if your singularity model is asymptotic at infinity, right? So that's what you mean by blow down. Yeah, I mean it in the, in the tangent flow sense at infinity. But you know, mm -hmm. you have say an ancient solution, um, mm -hmm. and it's and, and and okay, this ancient solution is high co-dimension a priori, mm -hmm. but its but blow down is a cylinder. So if you you know you mm -hmm. do the suitable rescaling at minus time minus infinity, take it blow down, then it's one of these generalized cylinders. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, then they have these um, sort of the, their approach is very different. They look at the dimension of the space of caloric functions and use it to give. Uh, estimates for sort of the, so coordinate functions are solutions to the heat equation mm -hmm. and caloric functions. And anyway, they can estimate the dimension of that. Um, and in particular, if you have these co-dimension one asymptotics, then you, they, they can say something about sort of what the original flow lives in and it's sharp, it lies in a n plus one dimensional subspace. Does it have to be the whole, does it have to be the whole blow down, which is one cylinder or is it just like, you know, some subsequence and, and then you will have this property? Uh, I ha I mean, I'm inclined to say the whole blowdown, but that's maybe too strong. I know that the techniques that I'm familiar with, you would want um, sort of a, a strong asymptotic assumption. Maybe okay. they can do it off of one sequence. So when, when I think of blowdown, I usually think that uh, yeah, it's asymptotically cylindrical. And I understand. Uh, anyway, yeah, you, might, yeah. you might have you might have a reason, or they might have a separate reason to actually your separate proof that if one sequence is going asymptotically, then you would actually converge. With yeah, they, they can prove things. I know they can prove things like that in co-dimension one. That's like the uniqueness one, of these but you, but cylinders. You know, yeah, but you don't know in, uh, in no in the higher co-dimension they have some uniqueness result for cylinders too, actually, mm -hmm. and maybe that applies also to the blowdown. Maybe it's case. yeah, yeah, might be the case. Um, in, in my context, what I what I, I should maybe elaborate on this question. So you know, maybe you're maybe you're familiar or not, but there are these uh, symmetry improvement results due to uh, like a uh, Brendel, Choi, Anjanant, Daskalopoulos session. Uh, what they do is they show that okay, the um, singularity model is asymptotically, let's say, cylindrical. This is co-dimension one. Then they can show that it it's that symmetry improves as you go forward in time. It's like a stability for the symmetry. So. This result would be like asymptotic planarity, you know, and then would mm -hmm. planarity improve under the flow? Um, so this for pinched flows, it does, you know, and and certainly, um, so like you could imagine these are so imagine imagine these are n minus one capital n minus one hyperplanes uh, here and here, and 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 your flow is maybe stuck in between these two. So that, that, that condition, they can act as barriers in, in high code dimension. Sure. So you, you can sure. be almost planar in an n plus one dimensional, n minus one dimensional plane. But you know my res the result that I discussed today is, is more like you're close to an n plus one dimensional subspace and then you stay close. Um, yeah. And you can't argue via maximum principle in this case. You can't try to like- Oh, for these barriers here? Or yeah. Uh, I mean, well, those, yeah. ones, those ones are co-dimension one planes, right? So yeah, like, yeah, those one. you can use as barriers, but you can't use it for this guy, certainly not, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, this is, yeah, no. I think in higher co-dimension, the right barriers are, they're co-dimension one in the ambient space. Um, so but, you, can't, you can't use like a distance function from a smaller dimensional. Well, what I would really, yeah, so. As, as a, as a, I mean, as a barrier for these guys. 
That's yeah, what uh, I don't think so. And what I would really like is, I would really like to interpret this assumption, and this is just heuristic, but as like a, a with assumption of some sort. I think there's a geometric monotonicity at play here. I mean, I know this means you're close to an n plus one dimensional subspace. I don't know which one. Uh, and, uh, but you know, if, if I did, I maybe could say, define this notion of width, and then it would be monotone. Um, mm -hmm. But, but I, I, this is like a, I think I like to hope that this is just a first order attempt at it. And then there's more to say here about stability of co-dimension one uh, in higher co-dimension. But, uh, well, there's more to say, I hope, but I don't know what it is yet. Oh, maybe, so maybe uh, draw another arrow here. So does this correspond to some notion of width and is that improving? Like in the same way that the, we understand the convexity assumptions, I think very well. So, and, and co-dimension one, I mean, um, yeah. But not, not there yet. Are there other questions? Oh uh, yeah. Don't see anybody. Well, okay. So if not, okay. Thank you very well, much. And uh, yes, uh, thank you for having me. A beautiful talk. Uh, thank you. I hope, I hope to see you back in New York sometime soon. Uh, but otherwise, yes, yeah. I very much hope that too. <laughs> it means yeah. we will be able to actually move around. <laughs> I'm looking. Yeah. Forward. Right. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Well, thank Have you again nice so much for the invitation and yeah, take care now. Have a great afternoon.